I was at a friend's house, and his father-in-law was there. And he sat in a chair with his arms crossed. He looked down, and he started flexing his arms. I've been in the gym, working out. My friend just kind of ignored it. I never miss an opportunity to make wonderful moments more wonderful. I said, I mean, this is just the first time I've met you, but tell me about your gains. Tell me about the growth that you've experienced. And then he started talking about all the workout that he's been doing in the gym, and my friend's just shooting me this look, like, why am I friends with you? And I just smiled and and listened intently. A couple minutes later, he started looking at his hand. It's like, you guys see this? My friend just looks at me. I'm like, what is that? He's like, that's my Hall of Fame ring. He was, a, he was recently inducted into his, his college Hall of Fame. He was, he was an old football player, and it's, it's really, I mean, that's, that's an impressive feat. And so I had to learn more. <laughs> and so I started asking him questions, and he started talking about his old football playing days, and he just kept going on and on and on talking about his old football days. And there's something, if you've ever been around somebody 20 to 30 years after a, a remarkable accomplishment, and they won the championship when they played, and that's, that's impressive. That's a remarkable thing. If you've ever been around somebody like that, there's just something about that chance that they have to reminisce, to go back. It's, it's a reason for a long time reunions were so popular. It was a chance for everybody to get together, to go back. It's a reason that everybody loves Shanty Days in August. It's, it's just the big old Algoma reunion. Everybody has the chance to come back and to reminisce. And there's just something about that time and that experience that people have where they just pause long enough to look back and to remember where they came from and some of the cool things that happened to them in that process. And today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 10. If you have your phone or your tablets, take it out. And if you haven't already, we really recommend that you download the Bible app. It's completely free and it's a great resource to have available to you. Uh, You can follow along. There's a feature within the Bible app called events and you can follow along either by enabling locations or type in the zip code. The zip code here is 54201. 54201, Lakeside Community Church will pop up. We're in the middle of something we're calling correction. It's a look at a letter that a guy named Paul wrote to a church that he used to pastor, but he still loved, and it was a church in a town of Corinth, so hence the name 1 Corinthians. And if, if you don't have the Bible app on your phone or your tablet, or if you don't do technology and you don't have a Bible, then we'd love to give you a hard copy of a Bible as well. Just see me afterwards, and that's our gift to you. We just believe that the best way to connect with God is to understand the heart of God. And that's revealed to us in scripture. And so that's our gift to you, totally free, but we just want to encourage you to look at that resource and to utilize that. So this morning, we're going to be continuing a look at a letter that an old pastor wrote to people that he cared about. And today we start by going back. And he starts this portion of his letter by taking them back to what God had done through their, fa- through their forefathers. And the reason we're doing this is not just a history lesson, but it's to answer a question that every single person asks at some point in their life. Every single person who's a follower of Jesus, and even people who aren't a follower of Jesus, but who are open to God, ask this question whether they realize it or not, whether they actually proclaim it or not. Every person asks this question of what is God's will for my life? So the person who follows Jesus, it oftentimes oftentimes sounds just like that. The question is, what is God's will for my life? What does God want me to do with my life? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And until you get an answer to this question, your life will be angst-filled, and you'll constantly be wondering and searching and striving for more, and you'll be wondering, am I missing something? Is there a bigger piece out there that I don't have? And for those of you who haven't made the decision to follow Jesus yet, you, you ask the question, it's just a little different, but you ask the same question, because within all of us, within our hearts, is a deep longing and desire for us to be reconnected with our Creator. Because every single one of us has to look around and say, there is something bigger than just me. There is something bigger than just me. 
And so every person at some level has asked this question of what's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? What's God's will in my life? Every person has asked this question, and today we're going to answer that question. So we're glad you're here. We start in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, where we read these words. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud, and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, if you're new to this, if you're new to following Jesus, or if you don't follow Jesus, and you hear these words, you're like, what? 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 And so what Paul's doing here is he's taking them back. He's taking them back to their forefathers who walked out of Egypt with Moses. He's taking them back. They were the Israelites, and they walked with God, and they saw the miraculous. They saw God take them from a, from a territory and from a country where they were people who were oppressed. They were slaves. They were oppressed. They were treated poorly, and God enabled them to flee from that, and he accomplished that purpose through the miraculous, and God walked with them. He walked with them, a cloud in the day and fire at night. God literally walked with them at parts in their journey when they were stuck in the wilderness and there was no food to be had. God provided food supernaturally. God literally rained food down from heaven in a supernatural feat that we're still obviously talking about. They walked with God and they saw some of the most miraculous displays of God. They made it to a body of water and they were being chased, the Red Sea. They were being chased by their oppressors and it looked like this is where we die. This is the end. We, we, are, we are cornered. There's no way. And God miraculously parts the Red Sea and made it so they could walk across the sea on dry land. They saw God do the miraculous. But don't lose sight of this. They were miserable the entire time. They saw God do miraculous things, and yet they were miserable. They complained. They grumbled. We look back in awe of all that God did in their presence. We look back in awe of the supernatural things that God chose to do, and they missed it in the immediate because they were miserable. Which is a cautionary tale for all of us and something that we have to come to terms with. And this is something that we have to understand. We have to understand that when we ask God to work in our lives, oftentimes he's going to, and it's going to look completely different than we expect it to. And the question is, how are we going to respond? How are we going to respond? When we ask God to use us, to work in our lives, to accomplish things bigger than us for his glory and his purpose, and then he does, and he takes us to a place we don't want to go, or he causes us to endure a situation we don't want to endure, or he causes us to move next door to somebody that we just hate and don't want to build a relationship with, how are we going to respond when we ask God, God, use me, and then he chooses to, but it looks different than what we expected it? to? Are we going to be content that God is bigger and God is greater and God has a plan and God has a purpose and God knows more than we do of the situation? Or are we going to fall back like the Israelites and like many of us have in the past and complain and be angry and grumble because it looks different than what we expected? Because God is not boxed in by our anticipation. And this is the question that we all have to come to terms with. Because the reality is this, God is going to accomplish his purposes, because God's greater than us. How are we going to respond? And we look back in awe and wonder, and we see all that God did. And they were people who complained about how long they were in the desert. They complained about how miserable they were. At points, they said, remember how great we had it when we were slaves in Egypt that we could go back to that situation and that circumstance. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, naturally. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. They saw God work. They saw God do the incredible externally. 
Externally, they saw God just literally part water. They saw God just miraculously provide for them daily, daily provision to meet their needs. They saw God do all of this. They saw God work externally, but they missed it internally. For them, the only work of God was on the external, and it didn't make its way into the internal. And they failed. They failed to respond in an according manner and to allow the God who was so active and doing so much out there that could be seen and experienced by all and was seen and experienced by them to not work in here. And this is what's so dangerous. That if God is accomplishing the miraculous and you are literally seeing it every day, that your needs are literally being met by a miracle, how quickly we forget. And how God can constantly be working out there but not in here. And this is the danger for a lot of Jesus followers. That we see God work, and we see God work so often that we just get numb to it. And all of a sudden, all of, all of the knowledge, all of, all of the things that we see God do, everything makes its way into our heads. But it fails to make its way into our hearts. Here we see people who saw God do the miraculous, saw him do the incredible, and yet they were miserable because it didn't look like they thought it would look because it wasn't done on their timetable or in their time frame. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Now, these things took place for us as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. This is important. Take note of this because here's an admission. Here's an admission that desiring evil isn't something that those people do. Desiring evil is something that we all can do. And we like to think of the worst case scenario that we can when we think of this desire for evil. We all have the Satan worshiper in our mind, the serial killer, just the worst of the worst that this world has to offer, the terrorist, and we like to think, well, that's that's the person, the person that we hate the most. That's the person who desires evil. That is the face of evil, and that is the person who desires evil. But what he's saying is, no, 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 no. The desire for evil is a, a lot closer than you think. And he says, this is done as a warning for us that we, that we might make the choice not to desire evil. And we hear that on the surface and we're like, well, who would desire evil? And then we peel back a layer or two and we look at our own hearts and we're like, oh yeah, me. I would. Because at some level, every single mistake that we've made, every choice that we've made, every sin that we've committed is rooted in the promise of fun. And if we're honest, when we start it is, it feels good. And if we don't check our hearts and if we don't check our lives, that instant feeling drives us. And we've all seen the horror stories, we've all read those stories, we, we We've talked about them, we've seen them, of where that path leads, and yet we all lie to ourselves and say, but it'll be different with me. I'll just flirt with evil. I'll get close, but I'll know when to pull back. And the heartbeat behind that is that we allow the desire of evil to just grow within us. And we say to ourselves, I'll contain it, I'll keep it down. But sin is a jealous mistress. I promise you it will grow larger than you ever imagined. You will look back and you will be filled with regret. You will be filled with just the 
angst and the wish that you could go back and change the outcome. And maybe some of you are there right now. And for those of you who are there right now, I want you to know it's not too late. You're not hopeless. God still loves you. But understand this as well. There is a consequence for your actions. And following Jesus is not a magic pill that takes away every consequence. It takes away the ultimate consequence, which is separation from God. But it doesn't take away every consequence in the process. And so trust will have to be rebuilt. Addiction will be very difficult to overcome. But let's not think this desire for evil is always out there when it rules in here just as easily. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. Well, okay, let's just, let's just talk about this, all right? The people sat down to do not be idolaters as some of them were as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So some of you are freaking out right now because we just served you breakfast. And now we're talking about <laughs> idolaters, right, who... Who they ate and they drank and they rose up to play. Well, this, wow, following Jesus sounds awesome. You get in trouble for eating, drinking, and having fun. Woohoo! Sign me up. I know that's what some of you are thinking right now, but no, no, no. There's, there's a little more to it than that. Idolatry is when we elevate anything above God. And in their case, it was a golden calf. So they just, they just made it out of oppression, they just made it out of Egypt. Moses is literally communicating with God, getting the Ten Commandments. And the people are like, you know, I really wish he'd hurry up. This is every dad before a road trip. I really wish, I really wish you'd hurry up. Like, I told you we had to leave a half hour before we had to leave just because I knew you were going to take forever, and you're still taking too long. Let's go. That's how the whole nation is. That's how they're all feeling about Moses and whatever he's doing on top of the mountain with God. It's like, let's go already. So they're like, you know what? We're going to throw a party. We're bored. We're going to throw a party. And so they take their gold and then they mold it into a calf. And then they start worshiping the calf. And then they get drunk. And then they start having an orgy. So when he says this idea of eat and drink and play, he's going the PG route of communicating exactly what they did. Exactly what they did. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single, what, in a single day. So they're sexually immoral people and God wipes out 23,000 people in a single day. Now I know that some of you are like, what? But, but hold on. Let's just get perspective of that. In the last three weeks, our economy has become crippled by the threat of coronavirus. Just crippled by the threat of that. So far, for perspective, and I'm not minimizing the threat, I'm not minimizing the danger, I'm not minimizing any of those things. I'm just telling you, so far, as of Friday, 3,404 people have died globally that we know of from the coronavirus. 3,404. Just for perspective's sake, God in one day wipes out 23,000 people. And what are we supposed to do with this? What are we supposed to do with this? Because I know for some of you right now who aren't really sure what you think about God, or frankly, even some of you who follow Jesus and who love Jesus and love God, you're like, that might have been an overreaction. 23,000 people? What in the world? And some of you are like, I, I don't. You're, you're, you have angst right now because you don't know what to do with this. And let me give you permission to do something that really freed me up once I, once I accepted this and really embraced this. God doesn't need you to defend him. God doesn't need you to manage his PR. He doesn't. 
If God didn't want anybody to know that he wiped out 23,000 people in a single day, there's ways God could have done it with wiping out 23,000 people in a single day and not had you know about it. A lot of ways. And sometimes we think that we have to manage the PR of God because I look at this and I'm like, whoa, he's not playing. He's not playing around. I mean, this is the ultimate parent as they're driving down the highway and for over two hours heard the stupid argument over what movie is going to go on the iPad so long that there hasn't been a dumb movie on the iPad for two hours because the kids just can't decide on what movie they want to watch. And this one wants to watch Star Wars. And this one wants to watch The Sandlot. And you're like, they're both great. Just pick a stupid movie and let's go. And they just keep keep arguing. And so you just pull over the car on the side of the road to let them know playtime's over. This is the ultimate dad move that God pulls. He's just letting them know, I'm done messing around. And we live in an age where people want justice. And I love that fact. That so many people look around and they want justice. They say, look at how many wrongs have been done. The people are advocates for causes that really matter and are really important. And that's great. But understand that if there's going to be justice brought about in this world, there is a price to be paid. And the standard of God is perfection. And when God looks down and he's just worked with these people and he's brought them out of oppression and they get impatient and they start worshiping something that was created rather than the creator and they start having an orgy amongst a confined community. Like, can you imagine something that's going to tear a community apart faster than that? God's had enough. And you don't have to like how God responded, frankly. You don't. God is not beholden to you for your permission to act in the way that he wants to. But just understand, for those of you who love and follow God, you also don't have to be his PR machine. Because there are going to be people who are skeptics and doubters and be like, oh, yeah, you serve such a loving God. How could he do this? You don't have to answer for God. God isn't in heaven and all around this world saying, oh, I'm really nervous I'm really nervous. I really hope Brian can figure out a good way to answer that question. Because I depend on it. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. As they were wandering in the desert, they questioned the wisdom and the goodness of the plan of God. They were hostile towards God. And God uses snakes. I mean, you want to question God about something? Let's question about the creation of snakes to begin with. And then a good God using snakes? That's that's my question. And then, and then we talk about complainers. People are just constantly complaining. And God used the earth literally to swallow. I mean, you can go back and, and read all of these accounts. And all of these things are recounted to us as a warning, as an example to us. And why does this matter? Why is this important? Because all of us have the question. God, what's the will for my life? What's the purpose for my life? Why do I exist? And the answer to that question is why we were created to begin with. To have community with our Creator. To bring about the purposes and the goodness of God. To praise and worship Him. And never become blind to that fact. Never fall, fall prey to worshiping the created instead of the creator. And we live in a majestic place. We live in a beautiful place. The beauty of God's handiwork is on display all around us. Just don't miss it. Like the Israelites did as they walked with him and saw him do the miraculous. And they missed it in the process. Never miss the beauty and the glory of God which is on full display all around us. But never fall prey to worshiping that which God has created rather than God the creator. 
Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way to escape that you may be able to endure it. So what's, what's the message for all of us? Well, the message for all of us is we were created with a purpose, and that's to have intimacy with our Creator. We've all made mistakes, we've all made choices, we've all sinned, the Bible tells us, and that has, that's messed up, that intimacy with our Creator. Because God's holy and He's perfect, and so in His presence, He, he puts up with no imperfection. It's, it's a pass-fail test, and congratulations, you failed. That's the message of the gospel. If you're, if you're angry, don't be angry at me, be angry at God. That's His rules, he's, he's the one who created it, that's just what the Bible tells us. Congratulations, you failed. Now here's the good news. God loves you anyways. And so He came... And he took on our humanity in Jesus. He was fully divine and fully human. And he came to pay the price for our mistakes, for our failures, for our sin. And he died on a cross because the cost of my imperfection, the cost of my sin is death. And that's a physical death that we will all experience. And Jesus experienced that on our behalf. And three days later... He rose again, proving that he was victorious over hell, proving he was victorious over death, proving he was victorious over sin. And so we have victory in what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. And that is the reason that we have been created, so that we can once again have community with our Creator. And that's available to us only through the work of Jesus and what he's done. And none of us measure up, but it's available to all of us. That's the beauty of it. You can't earn it. It's a gift. You have to accept it. So once we do, what's our response? And this is what he says. He says, watch how you live your life. Watch how you live your life. And when you think you're in a good groove, and when you think everything's going great for you, and when you think, I got this, and when you look at somebody else's mess of a life, and we all know who they are, and you're thinking of somebody right now. You are. You're thinking. It may be yourself. It may not be. But you're thinking of somebody right now. You're like, yeah, I know them. I work with them. I parented them. Or they parented me. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be. You're like, yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. When we think of somebody who's a mess of a person, he says, be careful. Be careful that it's not always you looking at them and thinking, hmm, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not like them. Be careful as you follow Jesus and you start to think, I've got this together, that I'm good. I'm in a good groove. Nothing, nothing's going to sidetrack me. I got this. I feel good about this. He says, be careful about that. Be careful about that. Because when you think you're strong, when you think you're above making mistakes, when you look down your nose at everybody else and you say, well, thank God I'm not that person, or thank God I'm not a mess like this person, he says, you, you better be real careful because the minute you think that way, you're about to lose it all. The minute you think that you're above something or that you could never you're living in the danger zone. Because you have failed to confront the reality of the evil desires that plague all of our hearts and that are very subtle. The minute you think you're set and that could never happen to you, you're in the danger zone. And the promise that he gives us is this, that you have to endure temptation. That we're all going to be tempted, and we're all going to be tempted by different things because we're all wired differently, and your temptation is going to look different than mine, and mine's going to look different than yours. But, but there's a whole host of things that can tempt us, and they're all there. But the promise that God gives us is this, that you don't have to give in. The temptation doesn't have to have the final word. And it doesn't have to win. The God is faithful and He is good. And if you want it, if you really want it, He will provide you a way out. But you have to take it. You have to take it. 
he proceeds to talk again about individual convictions and, and how we should live our lives. And then he closes the chapter with these three verses that I want to read to you. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Whatever you do, he says, whatever you do, and God has wired us all differently, and God has, God has wired us uniquely, and so he's given us different gifts, and he's given us different passions, and he's given us different abilities, that we're all good at different things, and that's beautiful because it makes a beautiful community. It would be so boring if we were all good at the same thing and we all had the same gift. So he says, whatever you do, whatever you're good at, whatever you choose to do, do that to the glory of God. And the question is very simply, do we? Do we? What's this look like? Well, it means that we give it our best. It means that we give it our best. It means that we understand that every talent, gift, and ability that we possess is ultimately given to us by God. And so when we operate accordingly, we can feel God's pleasure. And so we choose to do things to the best of our ability, to treat the people that we encounter the best that we possibly can, to love everybody that we see, to bless people, encourage them, and use what God has given us for him. It means we put in effort and we try to accomplish everything with excellence. We do the best that we possibly can every single time. That is what it means to do all to the glory of God. How else do we glorify God? By getting along. By getting along. You have different convictions than I have. That's great. You have different convictions than they have and I have. Perfect. Where scripture is clear, we will be clear. Where scripture isn't clear, there is incredible freedom. And we're not going to fight over those things. And it's our job to get along. Not to be the person who's abrasive. Not to be the person who's eager to argue about everything with everyone. No, 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 no. We are to be people who strive to get along with everyone. You want to see what God's will is for your life? It was just summed up right there. Right there. That you would glorify God and you get along. And when we think about when Jesus was asked by people who were trying to trip him up, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. You want to know the will of God for your life? That you love Him and you love each other. It's that simple. God, I pray that we would be people who love you. And love each other. I pray for the person here, God, who's right now just wrestling through where they stand. Just in life in general. And they know so much about you, but they just haven't taken the step just to surrender. And give their lives to you. And God, I pray today would be that day. That in the quietness of this room, even right now, in their hearts, they would embrace the fact that you are a God who created them and loved them. And your son Jesus came. He died on the cross. Three days later, he rose again. And that we can have freedom by giving our lives to him. I pray, God, that we would be people who strive to do our best for you. That we would be people who love you 
and we would be people who love each other. That we would get along. And God, I pray that each of us would look inwardly to make sure for those of us who follow you that it's not just in our heads, that it's made its way to our hearts. God, I pray that as we inventory our lives, we would check and we would make sure that we are on alert for the evil that comes so subtly. And in all things, we would try to honor you, that we would love you and each other. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.